It's a moment of truth. How many of you forgot to set your clocks forward? Nobody. I was the only one? All right. I mean, our 1030 service is a little more crowded than usual. I thought there would be more than, more than one or two of you. Hey, how many of you have ever had somebody say to you, man, you're so narrow-minded? You're so narrow-minded. It's typically not a compliment, right? When someone says, look, you're just unwilling to accept opinions, beliefs, or behaviors that are unusual or different from your own. You're just narrow-minded, right? You, you go to the same restaurant every time and you order the same thing off the menu. You are narrow-minded. Or your politics, you're not willing to listen to the other side. You're just kind of set in your ways. Or maybe somebody has said to you concerning your religion is, you are too narrow-minded. There are so many religions and so many paths out there. Why are you so narrow-minded? Well, when you open up the pages of the New Testament and you read about Jesus and his early followers, it becomes quite apparent that very early on, many people accused Jesus of actually being too open-minded. They would say things like, how can you spend so much time with tax collectors and sinners and talk to this Samaritan woman in the middle of the day and you just you seem to sound like someone who believes that, that everybody, you know, that more than just the Jews can be saved. Jesus, you just seem a little bit too open-minded. There's a, a great example of this. Peter, before Peter became the, uh, or actually after he became the leader of the first church, this is after Pentecost, after he received the Holy Spirit. One day, he ended up going to the home of a Roman centurion. Right, so this is a, a Roman soldier who was in charge of many other Roman soldiers. He invited Peter to come in. And so Peter goes to Cornelius' house where there are lots and lots of people in this house, many people from his own family. And the first thing Peter says when he gets through the door is, you all are aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. Which is like, that's not a good way to gain friends and influence people. I mean, if somebody showed up in your house and said that to you, you'd be like, who are you and who invited you here, right? Uh, but then Peter admits that he had sort of this awakening. This, he was on his rooftop just very shortly before that, and he received a vision. And he says, I now realize, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he ex- accepts men from every nation, not just the nation of Israel, but every nation who fear him and do what is right. Here's what we discover through the gospel of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, that everyone is invited to follow Jesus, that it is, in fact, a broad message for Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, Romans, rich people, poor people, male, female, slaves, free people, everyone. It's a broad message that's intended to reach Everybody, everyone's invited to follow Jesus, but only a few will accept his invitation. And here's the question that I want to deal with today, and it's simply this. Why do so few people accept the invitation to follow Jesus? Why so few? And this is the question that we're going to deal with today. So if you're new today, you know, maybe this is your first time here, or maybe you have not been here in quite some time. Maybe you're watching along with us uh, today. I want to kind of quickly get you caught up. We are in the Sermon on the Mount, specifically the second half of the Sermon on the Mount, and we're getting towards the end of it. Here's a review of what Jesus has been teaching thus far. He says, if you want to follow me, or if you want to display the characteristics of the kingdom, if you want to display these virtues of the kingdom of God, if you want to be a Jesus follower, here's what it looks like. You're going to be someone who's going to produce salt and light. When you show up in the room, your goal is to be a a ray of sunlight for people, right, to help lead the way, to be uh, someone who preserves, as salt in those days would preserve me, and I want you to preserve maybe a decaying situation. I want you to be anger-free. When someone hurts you, it will be natural for you to want to get them back or to kind of sulk in your anger. But as a Jesus follower, we're called to be angry, free people. We're called to forgive. You're called to have a pure mind, right? Because when you lust after a woman, it's, it's like committing adultery in your heart. You're called to be someone who's reliable, that your yes would be yes, and that your no would be no. You would not be wishy-washy or non-committal, that you would love your enemies, that you would be generous, 
right? and that you would work hard to get the hooks of greed out of your heart, that you would have integrity, that you would not be a hypocrite, that you would look one way publicly and act a different way on the inside, that your words and your lifestyle would match up, that from time to time that you would fast from food in order to get closer to God, right? that you would be calm and that you would not worry and not be anxious, that you would be compassionate, that when you're tempted to point your finger at somebody else to judge them, that you would first take the plank out of your own eye before you take the speck out of somebody else's eye. This is kingdom living. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus. So if you make this decision, it's going to mean that you're going to have to have the courage and the guts to stand out sometimes, to make difficult decisions, to be unpopular. So Jesus says it like this. This is kind of where we left off last week with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He says this. If you want to follow me, if you want to display these kingdom attributes, here's what you need to do. You need to enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. If I could illustrate it like this, broad is the road, right? Broad is the road. Many will choose to enter through this road that ultimately leads to destruction. Many will choose to be selfish. Many will choose to allow anger to get its grips on them. Many will choose to just be lustful and to look at anything they want on the internet because that's just kind of what everybody else does, right? Many will choose to be unreliable or to be revengeful that when somebody hurts me, I'm going to get them back. Many will choose to be greedy to assume that everything that comes into my hand financially is for me. Many will choose to be hypocritical or to just kind of be worrisome and, and always on edge, right? Many will choose to be judgmental. That's the broad road. Jesus says, you want to follow me, you got you to gotta choose the narrow road right? The narrow road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. The kingdom attributes, the characteristics of the kingdom that Jesus longs for us to possess. But it is a narrow road, right? Not many will choose to get on the narrow road. So here's the question that I open up the sermon with. Why do most people choose the broad road? Why do so few people find the narrow road. And here's the answer. It's because the narrow road can be agonizing. The narrow road requires concentration, effort, and at times great difficulty. So as I said last week, oftentimes Jesus would give the same teachings over and over and over because he had a different audience every few days as he traveled up and down the countryside and throughout the different villages in this land. And Luke actually takes this teaching, and uh, Jesus gave this teaching in another place, and Luke records it in Luke chapter 13. Here's how he describes it. Then Jesus went through the towns and the villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. So if we look at our map, this was like the, the base of operations for Jesus in Capernaum. Three times a year, he would make his way to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts, and he would stop along the way in different towns and villages to give them teachings. Right? And as Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, the text tells us that someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Which this question illustrates the fact that Jesus had been giving a different message, that many of the Jewish people thought that it was only Israel that would be saved, right? That you had to be a good Israelite. I mean, like the tax collectors and the sinners, they wouldn't be saved, but if you were a good Israelite, you could be saved. If you were a Gentile or a non-Jew and you sort of, you know, came into the Jewish religion and practiced the sacrificial system and went and did the whole feast, that you could be saved too. But this guy's thinking, okay, maybe this message isn't just for Israel and maybe fewer people get in than I think. So he's asking Jesus this interesting question. And Jesus responds by saying, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Make every effort 
to enter the narrow road. Now, this, this Greek phrase, make every effort, it's an interesting word. It's agonizomai, which sounds like agonize. Right? It, it means to contend with adversaries, to fight, to struggle with difficulties and dangers. Jesus is saying, if you choose the narrow road, at times, it's going to be agonizing. You're going to have to fight your way to the narrow road. And when you get on the narrow road, it's not always going to be easy. It's going to require effort and concentration and at times agony. So are you willing to enter the narrow road and get off the broad road? Let me illustrate this. So I love to go to amusement parks. I've been to some good ones. I've been to Hershey Park, Darien Lake, Kennywood. Anyone ever been to Kennywood? I didn't think so. A few of you, all right? And I love riding roller coasters. I've heard Cedar Point's like the greatest roller coaster capital of the world. But I got to tell you about the greatest ride that has ever been invented. And I had the great privilege to be able to ride it this past November. So let me tell you the story. We were mostly gifted a trip to uh, Disney World this past November. And we got in our minivan, the six of us, including a three-year-old, 22 hours it took us to finally make it to Orlando. You talk about agonizing, right? So we get there, and uh, one of the days we went to Animal Kingdom, and at Animal Kingdom is the greatest ride ever invented. And we got up at 6 a.m., because if you get up at 6 a.m., you can make it right at rope drop. So the rope drops, it's open, and the small crowd of people you're with, I mean, we are agonizing our way to the line. So we're like picking up people and tossing them, and we're elbowing our way, and we are getting, you're like out of the corner of your eyes, you're like, I'm going to beat you to this, you know, and you're, you got the strollers, and you're running over people. I mean, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not much, because you really want to get to this ride. It is what I'm told, it's the greatest ride ever. So you make it to the narrow gate, right? And since we got there so early, we got on the ride pretty quickly. Now, if you've never done the Flight of Passage, the Avatar ride, you get in this little wild banshee, right? And all of a sudden, this window opens up, and you are 3D glasses. You are flying in this Avatar. It is unbelievable. It is the most adrenaline rush four minutes of your entire life. And I got off that ride, and I was like, that was amazing. It was worth agonizing 22 hours to Orlando, getting up at 6 a.m. to make it on this ride. Now, if you choose the broad road, and you're like, I'm not going to get up early. I'm just going to get there when I get there. You go with everybody else. You're going to wait four hours for the ride, and you might not even make it. You might stay in a line, and then they just close the door, and the ticket guy says, get out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, you, you're not going to make it. So there's, there's actually a few people around the church who've, who've gone to Disney World, and I'll say to them, the first thing, I'll say, did you do the flight of passage? And every single one of them says, no, I didn't do it. And I just, my heart breaks for them. Because, and if you're here today and you've been to Disney World within the last five years and you did not do the rite of passage, right now you are feeling a great sense of loss and regret, right? Because you did not agonize to make it to the line. Jesus says, you want to make it on the narrow road where there's blessing, where there's, there's life that is truly life, where there's an abundant life? You want to have that experience? then you make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, and I would argue most, will try to enter and will not be able to because it'll be too late for them. They'll either die or Jesus will come back. And Jesus says in this parable, once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer. I don't know you, and I don't know where you came from, and then you will say, but we ate and we drank with you, and we had feasts with you, and you taught us in our streets, and we listened to your sermons, Jesus, and we were so amazed because we thought, wow, Jesus talks with a kind of authority that none of the religious leaders have. Jesus, we spent so much time listening to the teachings. We were there on the Sermon of the Mount. We saw you heal people. But he will reply, but I don't know you. 
or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. So back in the year 2000, 23 years ago, graduated from college, moved to Atlanta, Georgia. I lived there for nine months. I did a youth ministry internship at a church called Church of the Apostles, which was right near the city of Atlanta. And every Tuesday night, I would go to a church that was about 20 minutes away north of the city called North Point Church. It was a newer church, only around for about five years, smaller church, but they had this massive singles ministry on Tuesday nights. I would go out to the ministry, and one day they had this guest speaker there who happened to be the lead pastor of the church. And I was listening to him, and I'm like, man, this guy's a really good preacher. Like, and I honestly felt like for the first time in my life, I actually could understand a sermon. I'm like, this guy makes sense. I can actually apply what he's talking about. And so I began to listen to him a little bit more. He was a guest speaker again on a Tuesday night. So I went up to him after the service, and I said, hey, I really appreciate your sermons. They've been a great blessing to me. He's like, thanks, man. I really appreciate that. And we started to talk for a while. He asked me where I was from, asked me what I was doing. We had a nice little five-minute exchange. Well, fast forward 20 years later, right? And during those 20 years, I would listen to his sermons, and I would get some of his tapes, and I would listen to his podcasts, and um, read his leadership books, and he eventually became the pastor of the largest church in America. And his name's Andy Stanley. His dad was famous, but he was not very famous outside of the city of Atlanta when I first began to listen to him. Anyway, 20 years goes by, and he's doing a leadership workshop in Lancaster, which is about three hours south of here, and I took three or four people with me, and during intermission, we had an opportunity to go and meet him. So I stood in line. I finally get up to the front of the line where I'm going to meet him, and I say to him, I appreciate your ministry. It's been a blessing to me, and he did not remember me. And I, I, I got to tell you, and then he looked at me and he said, away from me, you evildoer, I never knew you. Go away where there's weeping. No, he didn't tell me that. But I, in all honesty, it was a really awkward exchange because I knew him. At least I kind of knew, like, I knew about his family. I knew about his ministry. I knew about his life when he was a child because I had listened to him for 20 years. And when I got up face to face with him, he's like, I, I have no idea who you are. Now, if he had invited me over, I would have spent time with him, but I didn't really know him. I knew about him. I listened to his teaching. I could tell you about him, but that's a big difference from actually knowing somebody. And so here's a question for you. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him or do you just know about him? Have you listened to a bunch of his sermons and listened to his teaching and watched some other people do some stuff, but you've never really known him or experienced him. Jesus says on that day, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. I mean, how sad will it be for the day when you're on the outside looking in at all of the heroes who have gone before you. He says, look, people will come from the east and the west and the north and the south. This isn't just for Israel anymore. And they will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. So on that day, in that particular countryside, when Jesus is giving this teaching, and he mentions the word feast, everybody knows what he's talking about, because if you were a Jew, you expected the next life to be inaugurated with a feast. Right? This is described in Isaiah chapter 25. The Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wine. Now, those of us who live in America, which is most of us, when we hear we're going to eat lots of fine meats, we're thinking, well, I eat fine meat every week, right? I eat fine meat in my lunchbox at school. I eat fine meat with pepperoni and sausages on my pizza. I eat fine meat all the time. No big deal. But if you lived in Jesus' day, you didn't eat fine meat unless you got invited to a banquet for someone who was a dignitary, I mean, you ate some fish, and every once in a while you got some, mine, some, some fine wheat. But when they hear that there is a feast coming in the next life, 
they're like, wow. And I don't know if this is meant to be taken literally or figuratively, but everybody is thinking to themselves, that's going to be an awesome day. I can't wait to be a part of the feast. Isaiah describes it like this. He will swallow up death forever. You and I will be swallowing filet mignon while Jesus swallows up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. That's going to be a good day because Jesus assumes that if you choose the narrow road, you get off the broad road and choose the narrow road, there will be moments where you will experience disgrace. Jesus says, when I come back, I'm going to take care of it. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. That's what you have to look forward to in the next life. And Jesus says, there's going to come a day when I come back or you die. And I sure hope that you've chosen the narrow path. And the very last thing that Jesus says in this teaching is recorded in Luke chapter 13 is, indeed, there are those who are last who will be first. First, who will be last. There might be a moment when you get into the next life and you're like, ooh, I didn't expect to see you here. (laughs) Or, ooh, I I didn't think you were going to make it in. Or, I thought so-and-so would make it in. This is mind-blowing for Jesus' original audience that the poor people and the beggars and the Gentiles and the tax collectors and the Samaritans would all be part of the end-time feast, and yet there would be some Jewish people who would be on the outside looking in. So, if your mind has drifted a little bit during this message, or maybe you just joined us online or doing some online shopping, I want to give you just a quick summary of what Jesus is saying here. Everyone is welcome. It's a broad message. It's a broad message. Everyone is welcome on this narrow road that leads to life. So get off the broad road and enter the narrow road that leads to life. It's a good road, but at times it can be agonizing. It can require concentration. It can require lots of effort. It can require, at times, experiencing disgrace. At times, having to make difficult decisions that are unpopular. But make that decision to follow Jesus. Make that decision to get on the narrow road because soon the road is going to close and the door is going to be shut and you don't want to get caught looking from the outside in. So, are you on the narrow road? Do you know Jesus? Or do you just know about him? Have you just sort of listened to his teaching from a distance, but you've never gotten to know him personally? So, I came up with a few questions because I don't want to be ambiguous. I want to be crystal clear. Because this is the most important question you'll ever ask yourself. Am I on the narrow road or am I simply on the broad road? Do you know Jesus? Will you be welcomed into the feast in the next life? So, I have a series of questions I want to ask you, and I've represented this with flags. The first question I have is, have you confessed that you are a sinner, not simply a mistaker, like, well, everybody makes a mistake and nobody's perfect. That's not what I'm talking about. Like, you have a deep issue with sin, Have you confessed that you're a sinner and in need of a Savior? Have you made a profession of faith? Romans 10, 9 says, have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead? If you have never done that, that's a red flag that you are not saved, that you are not on the narrow road, but you can change that today. You can get on the narrow road today. For the rest of you, if you're like, well, I've made that decision, I have some other questions that I want to ask you. Here's a yellow flag. Have you been baptized? I'm not saying baptism is necessary for salvation, but if you've been saved for a long time, like years, 
and you've never been baptized, you are a walking contradiction. Because Jesus and Peter and Paul say, repent and be baptized. And if you've refused to get baptized, you should question your salvation. So have you, have you been baptized? You can make that decision today. The third question I have is, have you repented of your sin? Right? Repentance. Repentance simply means that I'm going one way and I'm going to turn the other way and begin to follow him. For those of you who are, you're living in sin right now and you don't even feel guilty about it, you should question your salvation. If you're like sleeping with someone who's not your spouse, you should question. I'm not saying you're definitely not saved. I'm saying you should question your salvation. That should be a yellow flag for you. If you're persisting in a sinful lifestyle and you have no intentions of repenting of it and beginning to follow Jesus, that's a yellow flag. I'm not saying it's a red flag, but you should question, do you know Jesus? Are you on the narrow road? Next question is this, and I don't know any other way to label it other than to say, are you spiritless? If, if you're spiritless, like you're, you're just kind of always dragged to church and you don't ever feel the presence of the Lord, and I'm not saying you have to feel that at all times, but there's just a spiritless, you get dragged to church, you don't really enjoy being here, the songs come up and you can't wait until it's over, you don't really pray and you don't read the scriptures, and you just kind of feel dead, and that's been going on for a long, long time, there's no connection, that might be a yellow flag that you don't know Jesus. And lastly, are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? In your workplace, are you ashamed to tell other people that you're a Jesus follower? In in your school, are you ashamed that other people might find out that you're a Christian or that you're involved in a local church? If you're ashamed, that's a yellow flag that you may not know Jesus. And I want you to be on the narrow road because the narrow road leads to life. So, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to be sure that you're on the narrow road. I'm going to give you the opportunity right now to get off the broad road and to jump onto that narrow road. And I know it requires concentration. At times it requires great effort. At times it is agonizing because it means a difficult decision but it's the only road that leads to life, and it's worth it. And Jesus says, I've come to give you the abundant life. So you can make that decision today. For those of you who are Jesus followers, this is your opportunity to get baptized, to publicly profess, I want to get on the narrow road. I've been doing my own thing for too long. I've been living in sin for too long, and I need a Savior to rescue me, so I'm jumping off the broad road and I'm getting on the narrow road. So, in just a moment, I'm going to ask everybody in the room to stand up in just a moment. And I have some interviewers, some people who are going to meet with those who are going to get spontaneously baptized, and you're going to ask them a few questions. Uh, We've got, I think, three or four people who are already getting baptized. We've filmed their videos, um, and, uh, and we're going to celebrate that. But if you're here today, this is your day. And this is your opportunity to declare once and for all that you're a Jesus follower and that you want to get on the narrow road. So everybody stand up right now. Everybody, even if you're at home, you can try this. Go ahead and stand up. All of our interviews, I'm going to ask you to go to, back to the double doors. Those who uh, are, are already getting baptized, head back through those double doors. And if you spontaneously want to get baptized this morning, go ahead and exit out those back doors. And we're going to celebrate baptism today. Um, at this point, I think in just a few minutes, the kids are going to come. So if the kids are ready, they can come in as well because they're going to witness this. And as they're on their way in, in here, here's what Jesus told the crowds and his disciples on that day. Right? Here's what he said. 
He said, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You want to follow me, Jesus says? Sometimes it's going to mean agony. Sometimes it's going to mean pain. Then you're going to have to pick up your cross to follow him. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it, Jesus says, for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me, Jesus says, in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. One day Jesus is going to come back, or you're going to pass away before Jesus comes back. And it's my hope that you'll say, you know what? I was not ashamed of the gospel because I knew that it was the power of God for salvation. And I took a stand for you and I made difficult decisions for you. And at times it was agonizing and it took a lot of effort, but it was worth it. Because following Jesus, getting on the narrow road is always worth it, amen? So, if you want to get baptized today, This is your chance to exit out those back doors. The rest of you, I'm going to ask you to be seated. And we're going to, as a church, celebrate baptism. This is people giving a public declaration of faith. When they go under the water, they're being raised to new life. And when they are demonstrating being raised to new life, it's my encouragement that you would clap, that you would hoot and holler as a way to say, we're your church, and we want to come around you to spur you on as you begin this adventure on the narrow road. So let's celebrate baptism together.